Alright, I am back with a God of War Ragnarok video. Uh, today is the day that Embargo has lifted on reviews. I am recording this after that has happened. This is not something I pre-recorded ahead of the Embargo. Uh, I know a lot of people like had video reviews ready to go. Uh, I am not skill up. This is not going to be some like crazily detailed edited review. I wrote my official review on Forbes, obviously. Uh, and uh, I gave it a 9.5 out of 10. Uh, that reflects the overall Metacritic score, which I think currently is at a 94. So everybody seems to have liked it just as much as me. And so IGN gave it a 10. There's a lot of 10s out there. Um, I personally gave the last God of War uh, a 10. And I guess I can talk a little bit about that 0.5 difference to some degree. Uh, this is just going to be kind of me freestyling uh, about the game. I am going to stick with my no spoilers policy uh, here. So I'm not going to cover anything I didn't really cover in the review in terms of like reveals or story content or whatever, which I've tried really hard. I promise I really have tried to stay super light on spoiler stuff uh, for this in particular. Um, that has made reviewing this game kind of a unique problem because there are some things in the game when you're asking like what has improved from one game to the next game like there are some pretty significant things that are you might consider improvements but that I don't really want to go into detail talking about because they have story elements to them and I just it feels like something better experienced organically as it happens when you play because I know I liked experiencing those moments in the game and so that kind of stuff, I'm, I'm not talking about like plot twists and stuff, but like actual like gameplay things in the game. Um, that's going to be something I cover after actual launch. I'll give it a, a couple of days at least. Um, and then I won't talk about the ending or the story stuff for a, a, a while after that. Obviously, I will and I will mark all of this stuff as spoilers. Uh, but yeah, I loved it. It's, it's, it's an incredible game. Um, the Last God of War is one of my favorites of all time, um, one of my favorite single player games ever made. Uh, so needless to say, I had extremely high expectations for this game. Uh, I was not disappointed at all, really, in any aspect of this. I know maybe it's half point score lower, like freaking number scores uh, drive me crazy. But um, if you liked the last you know, reboot of the game, you will like this one. I don't have any idea why you wouldn't. Um, it is not what everyone, not everyone, what fanboys were saying about how this just looks like DLC for God of War. Like, this isn't going to be anything significant or new. That is not true. That is not true at all. Nothing about this feels like DLC. It does not feel like an expansion. It is huge. Uh, just a kind of normal taking my time playthrough of the main story and some exploration stuff took 30 hours. When I went through after that, and there is like some kind of endgame stuff to do after, uh, in addition to things you missed, that was more like 37 hours. If you're going to 100% it, it also depends on the difficulty. If you're like dying a bunch during fights, all of this will take longer. I was playing on normal. Um, you could put 40, 45, 50 hours into this, you know, relatively easily, I imagine. Uh, that is the common question I get of, of how long the game is, because everyone really wants to know that. So lengthwise, it is certainly long enough. Um... I think you end up going to almost all the realms, all the realms. I can't like name all of them in my head, but I'm pretty sure like not every realm is equal. Like if you've remember the last game, like you were, if you were in Muselheim, that was like mostly a combat arena. And so like some, some zones may be like kind of huge areas with tons to explore. And a couple of them may be smaller scale and there's not like a whole level there or things like that. But um, yeah, this is a, the full scope of pretty much the entire uh, Norse pantheon and, and realms here. Uh, also increasing in size is the cast. Easily, I can say that the best thing about God of War Ragnarok is its cast and its characters. Uh, obviously, the first game was heavily, heavily reliant on the dynamic between Kratos and uh, everyone always says they say it wrong. Atreus? I always say Atreus. I think it's Atreus. Um, and that that is still present, certainly. Uh, Atreus is older now and kind of coming into his own. And that creates sort of a, a new dynamic where it's more about like Kratos learning to trust his son rather than Kratos learning to be a father to like a young boy after his mother died. Like it's, it's similar, but it's different. Uh, and then the cast is just really, really fantastic because 
we have all these other characters. I won't reveal some characters that have not been previewed, but there are more characters past what uh, you've seen. But what has been in the preview materials, Freya is back. Freya's story is incredible in this game. I would say better than in the last game. Her role in the story here was one of my favorite parts of it. Uh, you will be shocked at how involved Brock and Sindri are in the story. The dwarf guys who make your armor and stuff. They have a they have huge roles in the story and are, are responsible for some of the best story moments. Uh, and then obviously you all know that Thor and Odin are in this game uh, as the villains. Incredible voice performances from uh, each of those guys, Ryan Hurst and Toby Ziegler. Uh, really a unique spin on those characters that we have not uh, seen before. And I'm not going to get into story details about the exact nature of the conflict and whatever, but like, you know this is like new Kratos, where if this was the original God of War trilogy, we'd be like butchering Freya and like mashing Thor to death with his hammer and like, you know, torturing Odin and like just ripping your way through the, the pantheon and like not to say you're not fighting these people, but like it is different uh, than the old format of, of the way things used to be with these games. And like these characters actually have like relationships and like yes they have rivalries but like everything is a lot more complicated than like kratos is angry and must kill his way through all of the you know gods in this pantheon that you've heard of like it is more complicated than that and a big part of this game is kratos trying to change and kratos not trying to be that guy anymore that was kind of part of the first game but that comes up uh, a lot in this game as well um my biggest problem with the story is pacing this is ultimately why I docked some points off a perfect 10. Uh, there are some pacing issues in this game where the beginning is very slow. And after a really kind of blockbuster opening, I was like, oh, it's Thor and Odin. Like, this is awesome. I counted and like just kind of casually playing through the game. I did not see Thor and Odin again in the story for 17 hours <laughs> of gameplay. Um, and granted I was doing some exploration and maybe that could be more like 10 hours or whatever, but it was a really long time uh, when we had like just seen these characters and like it just, then they kind of like fly away into the ether, which was very weird. Um, there are some segments around the middle of the game that I won't really describe, but like it's, it's like a bit of like a, maybe a, like a vacation time where it's not quite, it's a little bit divorced from the main story uh, but it lasts like a really long time. It's like this this segment in this one particular realm that you're doing missions and stuff and you're fighting, but it's it feels like a very weird aside. Like that segment almost feels like DLC. Uh, and that lasts maybe two or three hours, but it was I understand why they had that and like what they were trying to do with, you know, the the characters there, but like it that was one aspect that felt kind of oddly paced. Um the uh, pacing of sometimes uh, the level structure is, is wears on me a little bit. Um, there are some very cool, like open, not fully open world, but like more open segments uh, in some of the realms, especially later as you get further into the game with a lot to explore, all these little like neat side quests and things and optional bosses and stuff to find. Uh, it's not, it's not fully open world in the least. It's not Elden Ring. It's not Horizon. Um, I, I would say some of the segments uh, that are just a little more linear are, can get a little tiresome. Like, this game uses the, like, shimmy through a small space mechanic to break up a zone so many, so often. It's just, it's a lot, and I just kind of got a little uh, tired of that by the end. That said, uh, these zones are beautiful. They are gorgeous. They are fun to explore. The puzzles are uh, pretty engaging. I didn't 100% figure everything out. Uh, by the time I'm I'm ending here, because like some stuff, like I would spend I, a couple like areas. I'm like, how do I get over there? How do I get to that chest? I spent like an hour. I could not figure it out on, on a couple of these. So I literally am going to have to wait for someone else to write or walk through. I did like 95% of everything, but some things uh, I will, I had to wait for, but um, nothing that like prevented me from progressing in the story or anything like that. Uh, Another very, very strong highlight for me in this game is uh, combat and build crafting. Um, you, so you don't have to wait to get your Blades of Chaos this time. Pretty much after the first 10 minutes of the game, you will have them. Uh, you have skill trees for the Axe and Blades of Chaos again. 
Yes, you have lost all your armor. Yes, uh, your skill trees are reset. It was actually a really good line about this early in the game where it's like Brock or Sindri or someone's like, Kratos, what happened to all the armor we made you? And he's just like, I used it. <laughs> so just the idea is that, um, you know, he, he fought so much stuff that his armor broke and his his blades are and his axe are dull again. So, I mean, whatever. They weren't going to, like, give you all the upgrades from the last game. It's just like, but nor do we have, like, uh, an Assassin's Creed moment where, like, all of Itzio's stuff blows up in his house or something. That's not really, like, part of the story. It's just sort of a bit of suspension of disbelief. Uh, the combat systems are are really cool this time around. I think they're not, like, crazily different. Um, the skill trees are somewhat similar, with the exception that within a skill tree, if you use a skill a lot, uh, you will upgrade that skill in some way. So if I use the charged axe throw or whatever... Um, once you use that, I don't know, 50 times to, to hit an enemy or something, you will upgrade it to like a gold tier. Then you can invest XP into that node, and then you can choose to upgrade like um, the damage it does, uh, defense as you're charging the move, or like the amount of freeze it applies. Um, and then some of these are different, like some of these are different categories of things besides that. But uh, so like you and then you can change that any time later. So you can kind of set up like, okay, I'm going to do all freeze nodes in this thing. And so that's cool. It rewards you for using skills that you like a lot, but it also kind of encourages you to use more different skills because you're like, oh, I've only used this one skill like nine times and like I should probably use it more and then I can upgrade it. And then that might, you know, you might like that skill. Uh, it is um, pretty heavily into like getting you to switch between weapons a lot. Um, like there's one of the earliest upgrades is like, the blades will do more damage to frozen enemies and the axe will do more damage to burning enemies. So it wants you to kind of be swapping back and forth a lot. Um, each uh, thing, I think this is the same as the last game, you have like a, kind of a light attack special move and a heavy attack special move. Uh, really, really heavily reliant on the use of runes as a skill. Is it, is it runes? No, relics. Relics. Relics is a skill word. You find a ton of different relics that are kind of a, it's a weapon neutral move. Uh, where it'll be like you're sending out a uh, seeking projectile to a few enemies or you're creating a poison cloud. Um, the one I used is one you get a little ways into the game where it creates a realm shift, which um, slows down time. And then you can get kind of an, essentially like an armor upgrade. You have a, a piece of jewelry that lets you get a bunch of different um, runes you can apply to that. Uh, that's... Uh, I got an upgrade that lets me do more melee damage during a realm shift. So I would like pop the 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 slow mo thing and then do a bunch of hacking and get bonus damage from that. The armor sets there were armor sets that did things in the last game. I think they're even crazier here. Really enjoyed my central armor set. I used for probably eighty percent of the game is one where if I'm blocking, parrying, and barehanded hits, you will poison an enemy. That's what the chest does, and then your bracers and pauldrons or whatever the other two pieces will increase damage to increase melee damage to poison enemies by 40 percent so i would pretty much a, a lot of fights i would start by just like throwing my axe into something and then just going to town with my fists uh poisoning an enemy and then uh, i could pop the realm shift thing and then do just do crazy crazy amounts of bonus melee damage so that's just like one example of something you could do other things are like create like a stun explosion on uh critical hits and or things like that like uh one is just like increased range damage on weapons for like a more uh you know for projectile moves and things like that there there are a lot of these and by the end they give you i would say enough upgrade materials to sink into i don't know a half dozen sets to max them out at, at least um i ran into a couple weird upgrade issues by the end where i had missed some lower tier materials so when i got something cool later I couldn't actually upgrade it to the final tier because I, I didn't know how to get any more of the lower tier materials. That happened for a couple of like the rune type items. But like, I, I know some people don't really love the RPG stuff in God of War, but I think they do it really well, especially in this game. I think this is a huge highlight uh, of the game and I enjoyed kind of creating these builds and engaging in combat uh, in meaningful ways, probably enough to do a new game plus when I don't think it, I don't think the game launched a new game plus, but like a new game plus playthrough whenever that uh, rolls around. Um, in terms of kind of just larger context issues, like 
where does God of War go from here? I, I, I real, I'm obviously not going to talk about like specifics of the ending. Um, this was always said it was going to be the the end of the Norse saga. I would describe the way it concludes as satisfying, emotional, but also I very much think they're going to keep making God of War games. Um, I will go deeper into that later, but this isn't something where, you know, you like the game, you like the game, and then they screw up the ending. I don't think they screwed up the ending. I think the ending is, is great. Uh, and I don't know what else to really get into other than all that. Um, I think those are, are kind of the highlights with just a couple lowlights, but it's an, it's an incredible game. Easily one of my favorites uh, of the year. If not my favorite, I really got to do some thinking about whether this or Elden Ring is my game of the year. Maybe Marvel Snap's my game of the year. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it is very good. Uh, it's it's very different because like Elden Ring barely has story. It's like the story is just lore and like this really creepy world. It was like God of War is excellent story, excellent acting, and very fun combat. But Elden Elden Ring was just it was it felt like such a unique experience. Like the combat, the um, the way you could build out your characters, like the the difficulty, like it. Oh man, I don't know. It's it's very close. I'm probably going to do an article about that tomorrow and in, in my final thoughts there. It is neck and neck. It's just it's a little apples and oranges. It's just if but if you gotta pick one, it's that's gonna be tough. But the fact that we're even having this conversation at all, this easily could have been a disappointment because because God of War twenty eighteen is such an incredible game that like where do you even go from there? Like it feels like there's almost nowhere to go but down. Instead, the scores are pretty much exactly the same. And even though I might have like a couple pacing issues or level design, like it is tiny, tiny things in the face of just an absolutely stunning game. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Absolutely play God of War 2018 first. <laughs> um, you, I, I just, I don't know why you would skip that. Like it's, it's really too important, both in terms of like the story stuff, but also just developing the relationship between uh, Kratos and uh, Atreus. Atreus. Uh <laughs> That is very important. So I, I would not play this without playing God of War 2018. I don't know why you would skip that game anyway, but that is my advice. Uh, and yeah, I will have some more thoughts, tips, articles, uh, talking about some things I can't talk about here later, and then way down the line, some ending stuff, discussions. There, there will be a lot of, of coverage coming. So uh, check for that both here and uh, on my Forbes site. So. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the game when it comes out uh, about a week from now. Take care. Bye.